Okay, so uh, Agamben. Um, so I think you'll find he's he's quite a different thinker from Schmidt. Um, Perhaps, you know, arguably Agamben and Schmidt are the two most unlike each other theorists of any week um, of the course. Um, but I think, as you'll see, um, while Agamben takes things in quite a different direction than Schmidt, uh, uh, and he brings in various sort of post-structural ideas, which we'll expand more on in the, in the coming weeks, um, he, does, he does actually um, draw heavily on Schmidt. Um, and so for both theorists, the state of exception uh, is really absolutely central to their work. Um, and so that's, that's why I've put them both together in this week that I've titled uh, The Exception. So even though they may seem very different, I think there's, there's something important in common between the two of them. Uh, okay, so today, as usual, we'll look at Agamben's uh, life. Um, then we'll consider some of his ideas that have been taken up in international relations. Um, so we'll consider his idea of bare life as, as distinct from, uh, from bios and, and zoe. Um, and its relationship to sovereign power. Uh, we'll look at his idea, or the idea of, bi of biopolitics that he didn't invent, but he, he takes up. Uh, and we'll think about how bear life and the state of exception uh, relate to his idea of the camp. Um, now, all of these things, again, they form a big picture. They're all connected to each other. Um, they're all pretty inseparable in Agamben's thought. Um, so, you know, we'll spend a bit of time on each, but. You know, you hopefully they'll all, all fit together by the end, and you'll and you'll see what he's talking about. Okay, so Agamben was born in 1942 in Rome, um, which I guess makes him the second Italian we've looked at in this course. Uh, they've mostly been, I think, we've had two Italians, a, a, a Brit, and the rest have been German. So finally, we're we're starting to move away from Germany here. Um, he studied law and philosophy in Rome. Um, where he completed his uh, doctoral dissertation. Uh, he taught in a number of different places, including the University of Verona, the University of Maserata, um, both in Italy, um, the Heinrich Hein University in Dusseldorf, uh, the College International de Philosophie in, in, in Paris, uh, the European Graduate School um, in Sassfi, uh, and the New School in New York, uh, and the University of Venice. Uh, currently, he's teaching at the Academia di Architectura di Madrisio. Um, so, you know, he's had a fairly academic focused life, but he has moved around a lot, at least within Europe. Um, but he isn't just an academic, um, he's willing to stand up for what he believes in. Um, he's, he's protested personally against the US uh, government's response to the 9 11 attacks um, by resigning from his position as a visiting professor at, uh, at New York University. Um, he also refuses to travel now to the United States uh, because of uh, uh, its uh, what he calls biopolitical tattooing, um, which you face at the border. And we'll, we'll look into um, uh, what that means a little bit later. It's actually a really important part of his thought. Um, I mean, does anyone travel to the US? I'm sure some of you have traveled to the US, right? Like what, you know, you go through the border and you get a whole lot of information taken from you, fingerprints and photographs and, and all, this kind of, uh, all this kind of stuff. Um, and for reasons that will become apparent as we go through Agamben's ideas, um, this can be quite problematic. And so Agamben refuses to participate in this whole, in this whole system. OK, one of the key distinctions that underwrites Agamben's uh, political thought generally is the idea of bios and zoe, um, which he takes from the well-known um, Greek philosopher Aristotle. Um, so he suggests that Aristotle's conception of the state is based in the difference between these two terms. So both of these terms in Greek mean life, um, but they identify two quite different things. So zoe. Uh, refers to the biological fact of life, right? What, and um, we can associate this as well with what we might call the private sphere. Um, so you know, the zoe is our existence as biological, natural, uh, living beings. Uh, bios, by contrast, is public life. It's uh, uh, the realm of politics, right? So when we're talking about the good life or when we're talking about uh, a good life, um, bios is what we're talking about. Right, so we're contrasting here this natural life uh, with political life, or life in a community. Now, this distinction was really important for Aristotle uh, because it allowed for the regulation of um, 
uh, sorry, the relegation of natural life to the household, um, the private sphere, uh, while at the same time allowing us to discuss the good life um, as developed through participation in a political community, right, in a polis. <clears throat> now, um, this distinction, again, Ben argues, is still really central to Western politics. Um, in fact, he, he thinks that Western politics is basically founded upon what it excludes from politics. So it's founded um, uh, by setting the natural life of the private sphere, the, uh, the, the zoe, outside public life, outside the bios. Um, and that's what we find in, a, in, a, in this uh, typical liberal account of politics, right? An account of public sphere and private sphere. Um, and it's even what we find in thinkers like, uh, like Habermas. However, it's debatable whether um, this account of the sharp distinction between the zoe and the bios uh, is really what we find in reality and in practice. Um, and Agamben thinks that political theorists have more or less just assumed this distinction without really interrogating it um, all that critically. Uh, one exception to this, um, in Agamben's view, uh, is Michel Foucault, who we'll be looking at um, uh, just after the break in week seven. So Foucault, uh, Agamben thinks, um, critically theorizes the relationship between Zoe and Bios in his account of biopolitics, which, which Agamben draws on in his own work. So biopolitics for Foucault um, is a kind of political rationality which sees the administration of life and of populations uh, as its subject. Right? It aims at ensuring, uh, sustaining, and multiplying life. Um, so it fundamentally aims, um, uh, in other words, at ordering life. So it orders life for the purpose of ensuring, sustaining, and multiplying it. Um, now, we'll, we'll touch on biopolitics a little bit again, but I think, when we um, discuss Foucault. But the main takeaway for now is that Foucault sees the development of biopolitics and biopower, um, this administrative apparatus um, that sees the zoe, the, the natural life, as something to be ordered by or, or for the bios, um, for political life, um, as this modern invention. Right? So biopolitics for Foucault is this new form of politics. It came about when the modern state uh, ceased to use purely repressive or negative force or power. Um, uh, it developed, the state developed the capacity and the, inclina the inclination um, to do more than simply say, you can't do this, you can't do that. Right? Um, it, it, it developed on top of this power um, a network, this closely meshed, uh, closely meshed grid um, of material coercions uh, for the purpose of managing the zoe, for the purpose of ordering and structuring um, life in the interests of the state. So as Foucault puts it, biopower, which is uh, biopolitics, um, what underlies biopolitics, uh, biopower is a power bent on generating forces, making them grow and ordering them, rather than one dedicated to impeding them, making them submit or destroying them. Um, and he, Foucault thinks that this is a new power, a power that was really only developed uh, in the modern state. And in fact, Foucault's account of history um, recalls, but then kind of develops, Schmidt's view of the power of the sovereign. Right? So he notes that until the modern era, uh, the sovereign had the power to decide life or death. Right? It was a power over life that could be made uh, concrete through requiring death. Right? So it could, it could kill. Um, so in other words, the sovereign got to decide whether you lived or died, but the sovereign didn't get to decide more than that, just whether you lived or whether you died. Biopower, by contrast, is a power to, uh, as he says, foster life or disallow it to the point of death. Uh, so biopower um, is the order of life to make it grow or the order of life to suppress it. Uh, it's the power to channel natural life, to channel zoe, um, down certain paths, direct it and control it, rather than just kill it. So this is clearly not, it's clearly not the power of um, life and death. It's not the same. Um, it's not the simple decision between life or death, which was the traditional power of the sovereign. Um, it's not just this, you know, uh, 
you'll do what I say or I'll kill you, uh, but rather it's a matter of structuring how you actually live. So Foucault thinks that biopolitics and biopower developed in, uh, in the modern era um, and began to concern itself with a whole series of biological processes um, that were previously outside the realm of sovereign power, the, the power of life or death. Uh, began to document um, uh, propagation, you know, births and mortality, uh, the level of health of populations, um, life expectancy and the longevity of uh, populations. Um, and at the same time created a whole series of interventions and regulatory controls in order to manage and control all of these things. This was, this was a new thing. I mean, these days it seems kind of obvious, right, that the state should be collecting data so as to uh, measure population life expectancy and to institute policies to try to uh, manage that life expectancy. Um, sort of taken for granted that the state has an interest in births and deaths um, and recording these things and in creating policies around them. Um, it's just common sense that issues of birth control are in some ways uh, a matter for the state, right? And that's why we have laws. Every society these days has laws that decide when and under what conditions uh, women are allowed to terminate pregnancies, right? I don't think there's any modern state um, with no laws about that at all. Um, which is odd when you think about it. Um, and even when we say, you know, the current law is not right, it doesn't get it right, um, we generally still assume that some law about these things is required as necessary. Um, and this is an incredibly new historical development. This is a new thing. Um, this is something that really only came about in, uh, in our modern era. So part of Foucault's work as a historian um, and as a social theorist has been to trace the development of biopower and chart the institutions that manage it and that implement it. So again, Ben thinks that Foucault and his concept of biopower, he's got a lot right. He thinks he's explained a lot about the way society, uh, modern society works. Um, because biopolitics and biopower um, uh, is this really useful way of making sense of the connection between the zoe and the bios, right? It shows that the zoe is not outside politics, but it's actually right in the center of politics. The management of the zoe is part of the bios, right? Our natural lives are in the modern state, uh, a matter for state power to manage and control. So Foucault's work for Agamben um, doesn't just take this distinction between Zoe and Bios for granted, uh, tries to understand the relationship between the two things. But Agamben is not 100% on board with Foucault um, for one main reason. He doesn't think that biopolitics is actually as new as Foucault claims it is. Uh, so unlike Foucault, he doesn't consider it to be something that's developed only in the modern era. Now, I think he's willing to concede to Foucault, uh, perhaps, that the specific instantiation of biopolitics um, that Foucault charts in his work is a new, uh, is a new thing. Um, but in his view, biopolitics has actually always been at the center of politics. Uh, and in fact, he argues that the production of a biopolitical body is the original activity of the sovereign power. So for him, uh, the connection between Zoe and Bios is not a modern thing, it's not a new thing, it was always something that was at the heart of politics. Uh, and in fact, he thinks that the ability of the sovereign to control and manage Zoe uh, is a basic power of the sovereign. It was never just the ability to decide life or death, uh, it was also this management of the Zoe as well. So in other words, for Foucault, society became biopolitics, um, but for Agamben, this was actually the original state of the political realm. Uh, Zoe was never outside politics. It was included in politics right from the very start. But as I said earlier, Agamben is, will, uh, is willing to credit to Foucault um, that biopolitics is now a much more uh, obvious part of politics. Uh, and all of the various things I mentioned before, like the management of populations, of birth, of health, 
um, all, all these different kinds of things, as well as all of the state apparatuses and institutions that have been created to control and manage all of these things. Um, they're all new. That's, that's true. Um, so why then does Agamben think that the zoe was always part of the bios? Now the answer to this question is a little bit, a little bit tricky, um, and it sounds at first like Agamben is being kind of intentionally obtuse. He's being intentionally difficult, um, but you'll have to take my word for it, um, and hopefully you'll soon see, uh, you'll soon see that um, he's not being intentionally difficult. There is something in what he says here. Um, Agamben suggests that zoe uh, was for Aristotle included in the bios by being excluded from it. Right? The exclusion of Zoe in, uh, is a particular kind of exclusion that actually is not entirely exclusive because Zoe is in this fundamental relationship to the bios. Um, so it's not a straightforward exclusion. It's what he calls an uh, inclusive exclusion, which you know, sounds weird, but it does actually, it's a term with meaning. So yeah, you're probably thinking, you know, inclusive exclusion is not a thing. You're either included in something or you're excluded from something. Um, you know, inclusive exclusion is just this kind of term that sounds deep sounding, um, but actually there's no real meaning there. Uh, but in actual fact, the gammon means something quite specific by this term. Uh, and this concept ends up being really, really important for his thought. So one way that Agamben expresses this idea of inclusive exclusion is through the notion of the ban. Uh, so think about things like this. Uh, does anyone here have Russian citizenship or Russian permanent residency um, or any other kind of relationship with, with Russia? No, no one does. Um, so no one in this room has any relationship with Russia at all. Um, so we all have uh, exclusive exclusion from the Russian political body, right? We're all completely outside it. Um, just completely, 100% excluded from the Russian political body. But what if I was banned from Russia, right? So I was banned from Russia, and you have no relationship whatsoever to Russia. So of the two of us, who is more included in Russian politics or the Russian political realm? What do you think? Exactly, exactly. You, you have a connection to it, right? Because you mean something to it. So the basic idea is that by being actively excluded, specifically excluded, um, by being banned from Russia, I have a fundamental connection to it that none of you have. I'm included in the Russian political realm, in a sense, by virtue of the fact that I've been specifically put outside it, right? You have no connection whatsoever to Russia. There's just no fundamental relationship at all between you and Russia. Um, but I exist in this relationship of inclusive exclusion, right? You're just, you're just excluded, but I'm inclusively excluded. So this is where we get to the idea of, of Schmidt's thought uh, when it comes to a gambling. So as we discussed on, on Tuesday, for Schmidt, uh, sovereign is he who decides on the exception. So a sovereign has the power to declare, uh, declare a state of emergency and to suspend any and all rules in order to do whatever they deem necessary. Um, and if you recall, uh, the sovereign's power to decide, to decide on the exception, also extends their, uh, to their ability to declare uh, something or someone an enemy. It's, uh, so you know, part of this is the uh, ability, uh, the power, to decide on the distinction between inside <clears throat> and outside, right? No one but the sovereign ultimately has this power. Uh, only the sovereign can determine that something is the exception um, and can decide how to relate um, uh, in response to that exception. <clears throat> so for, for Schmidt, this is the basic power that characterizes the nature of the sovereign. Thinking about uh, the sovereign's power to decide on the exception in this way um, is maybe a little bit too uh, a little bit too limited for Agamben's view. So he agrees with uh, uh, philosopher uh, Walter Benjamin, who we won't be looking at in this course. Um, but Benjamin is one of the theorists who 
uh, received the sub subterranean influence of Schmidt that I referred to yesterday. Um, and in fact, uh, in Schmidt's later life, when he had no official position um, and basically wrote all of his books from home, uh, Benjamin was a, was a frequent visitor to his, uh, to his house. Now, Benjamin's view is that Schmidt is right in thinking that, so the, thinking that the sovereign power um, is to decide on the exception. But he thinks that we focus over much on the state of emergency, those times that are clearly instances of uh, uh, the sovereign stepping in and exercising their fundamental power. In reality, uh, Benjamin thinks, uh, these days the state of emergency is basically the rule, right? It's not something that's anymore isolated to uh, emergency periods. In fact, he thinks the sovereign can and does decide to include or exclude uh, on a pretty much a daily basis, on a regular basis. Um, so this power to decide on the exception is, he thinks, no longer actually the exception itself. Uh, it's become the rule. It's, it's something that just happens all of the time. <clears throat> so we can think of a gambit as bringing together these three ideas. So we have the idea of the ban, right, the idea of the inclusive exclusion. Uh, we have Schmidt's definition of uh, sovereignty as the ability to decide on the exception. Uh, and we have Benjamin's view that the state of exception is permanent, it's ongoing, it's not this exceptional thing itself. All of these three things work together uh, to show the way that life itself, natural life, or, or zoe, uh, is politicized. Um, through, so basically through exercising the power of, of sovereignty, by exercising the, the ability to, to decide, the ability to include, the ability to exclude, uh, the sovereign can abandon natural life to the unconditional power of death. It can abandon life to the unconditional power of sovereignty. Because remember, right, the sovereign can do anything. It decides on the exception, and it decides on what to do about the exception. So the sovereign decides that particular individuals, that particular natural life, is outside BIOS, right? But in excluding it from BIOS, it makes it so that it is no longer Zoe either, right? Because it, it was Zoe before, it was always Zoe before, it started off as Zoe. Um, but by politicizing it, by politicizing Zoe from actively excluding Zoe from the BIOS, natural life becomes neither Zoe nor BIOS. It's neither of them anymore. Instead, that life, Agamben thinks, is completely abandoned to the raw power of the sovereign. Uh, this is the power to do what it likes, when it likes, subject only to its own decision, subject only to its own will. So by situating life as neither Zoe nor BIOS, that life is completely open, completely exposed to sovereign violence. Once you're in that state, right, uh, the sovereign has absolute power over you. You're neither a member of the political community um, and therefore subject to the law, nor are you in the private sphere where you're protected um, from the sovereign by being outside politics, because the private sphere is supposed to be outside politics. So your natural life, your private existence, has been included in the political by the virtue of its exclusion from the political, um, which means you no longer have any clear status. You're no longer clearly Zoe. You're no longer clearly Bios. Um, and this is what a gambin calls bare life. Um, and this idea, this idea of bare life, is really absolutely central to his uh, to his political thought. So this is something I really want to, to go over at length. I really want you to get a clear grip on this. So if you don't have a clear grip on it by the end of this lecture, please bring it up again in tutorial, because it's really, it's really important. All right, so to reiterate then, bare life is not natural life, uh, because natural life is outside politics, right? The distinction between Zoe and Bios is supposed to capture this. Zoe is the private sphere, and Bios is the public sphere. Zoe is our existence as as living natural beings, and BIOS is our membership in a political community. 
So bear life then can't, it can't be natural life because bear life is politicized. It's subject absolutely to the power of the sovereign. So we can think of bear life perhaps as politicized natural life. It's not, therefore, something that we're born with, all right? It's not this natural life that we put culture on top of. Um, we can't get stripped down to bear life um, as if bear life was this original form that, that um, uh, bios is, is, is put on top of. Um, our original form of life is natural life, it's zoe. Um, bear life is a departure from natural life. It's something that happens to us, it's not our natural state. So in other words, bear life, it's not zoe, it's not bios. It's neither of those two things. Uh, we can think of it instead as life exposed to death. It's life exposed to sovereign violence through the decision of the sovereign to exclude that zoe from the bios. Okay. I mean, we can stop for a sec if you have any questions about that, because it's a, it's a tricky idea. This sort of inclusive exclusion is not intuitive. Yeah? Can you um, explain the three states? The different states? Uh, like, yeah, so, so Zoe, bear life, uh, Zoe is not bear life, Zoe is natural life, right? Um, and in natural life, we're outside the power of the sovereign because we're not, it's not political. So the private sphere, is supposed to be this protected realm um, that is where we just live our natural lives, right? We leave that zoe to enter the bios, and the bios is the political realm, and the political realm is governed by law. When you're uh, excluded by the sovereign from the bios, you don't go into the zoe again. You can't go back into there. You're not protected anymore by, by being able to escape into the private sphere. But also, you're not, you're not governed, you're not protected by law in the BIOS anymore. So you're outside both of them. And that's bare life. Right? It's life that has been excluded from the BIOS and by virtue of that, excluded from Zoe as well. So you're not protected by law. You're not protected by being outside politics. You're in politics. But you're not governed by the law. And so the sovereign can just do anything it wants to you. You have no rights at all. Does that make sense? <clears throat> any, other, any other questions about that? <clears throat> um, okay. Yes, yes and no. We'll come to some examples um, shortly in which you aren't prisoners, um, but prisoners are a really important um, case of that. Um, so we can see it really easily, I think, in something like um, the detention camp like Guantanamo Bay. Um, and again, Ben actually focuses um, and discusses in his own work specifically the, the internment camp um, at the US naval base in, in Guantan Guantanamo Bay in, um, in Cuba. So those who are interned in Guantanamo Bay, um, they don't have BIOS, right? They're not part of the US political community. Um, but they're not outside the US political community either, right? They're in this zone of indistinction. Um, they're included in that community by virtue of the fact that they're specifically excluded from it, right? Because they're not subject to normal American law. They're not, they're not on US soil, for one thing. Um, so they aren't protected from the power, from the whims of the sovereign, by virtue of uh, you know, US law. Um, but they're absolutely not outside uh, the US political community um, because they're, they're prisoners of the United States, right? Um, so as a, as a result, they live in this realm of bare life, right? They have neither BIOS, they have uh, nor, nor Zoe. Um, they've been decided by the sovereign um, that they're excluded, right? that they're the exception, uh, and as such, they're completely open, completely exposed to sovereign violence. So Agamben talks about their status as, uh, as unlawful enemy combat uh, combatants. Um, and he thinks this is, this is basically meaningless terminology, right? in the sense that it's not a category that's at all recognized um, by the international community. Uh, by being called an unlawful enemy combatant, 
uh, they're effectively banned from international legal and political frameworks, right? They're not US citizens, so, um, uh, you know, they're not, they're not captured by US law, so therefore they, they're not lawful criminals. Um, like if, I, if I committed a crime in the US, uh, generally speaking, I'd just be a criminal. I'd be a lawful criminal. I'd be a criminal under the law. Um, I'd be included in the US community um, uh, fully by virtue of being a lawful criminal, right? Or a criminal under the law. Those interned at Guantanamo, though, um, they're unlawful, right? They're not subject to and protected by the US legal framework. They're the enemy. On the other hand, if they were just enemy combatants, right, they'd have certain rights under international law. Uh, the US has signed treaties, signed declarations, setting out what they can and can't do legally according to international law uh, to enemy combatants. But unlawful enemy combatants, they're outside this framework as well. So they're simultaneously inside the law and outside the law. Right? They're between international law and domestic law, uh, and they're protected by neither of those things. So this category, this category of unlawful uh, enemy combatant, is one in which the sovereign can decide that certain humans are no longer meaningfully human. Right? They're neither Zoe nor are they Bios. And the sovereign can therefore do anything they want to these people. They can torture them, they can kill them, they can do anything they like with more or less total impunity. I think another example of this is uh, maybe a little bit closer to home. Uh, the Australian uh, camps on Manus Island and, and, uh, uh, and, and Nauru. Because, um, of course, what exactly is the status of the people in these camps? Right? They're, in a way, unlawful refugees. Right? They're not simply refugees, because if they were refugees, they'd be covered by uh, uh, international law. Right? Um, Australia has signed up to various international legal conventions about what you can and can't do to refugees. Um, but nor are they covered by Australian law. Uh, they're not on Australian soil, for one thing, right? Um, so they're absolutely subject to the whims of the Australian state. They're neither inside nor are they outside the Australian political uh, community. Uh, they're not inside because they're not protected by Australian law, um, but they're not outside either because they're literally the prisoners of the Australian state. So because of this, um, the prisoners on uh, Manus and Nauru, um, they have had their natural lives politicized. Right? They exist in the situation of bare life in which they're completely exposed to sovereign violence, to sovereign power, to sovereign whim. Uh, the sovereign can do anything it likes to these people because they don't even count as human. Right? If you're Zoe, you count as human. If you're Bios, you count as human. If you're neither of those things, you do not count as human. Um, and this is pretty well reflected in uh, the treatment of these people in these detention centers. Um, by all accounts, it's nothing short of horrific. Another example, and maybe this gets to, to your question before about, about prisoners, um, and I think one that affects us a bit more directly, um, is that of airports, right? So airports are examples of this, um, specifically international airports. Uh, and this is part of the reason why, as I mentioned before, a gambin doesn't like to fly to the United States, because they're among the worst in terms of turning airports into a realm of bare life. So why are, example, uh, why are airports examples of this? Um, well, let's say you wanted to fly to the United States. You get on a plane in New Zealand, right? Um, probably Auckland Airport, but not necessarily. Uh, then you fly to usually San Francisco or LA, is the closest, um, and you disembark at that airport, right? But when you disembark, you're not in the United States. You have to pass through customs first. So in this space, uh, between getting off the plane in San Francisco um, and passing through customs, you're in this zone of exception. Uh, you don't have bias, you're not protected by New Zealand law, right? you're not in New Zealand anymore, um, and you're not protected by US law because you're not in the US, right? and presumably you're not a US citizen. Um, 
But of course, physically you are in the US, so the US state has power over you. Um, and in fact, it has pretty much unlimited power over you. Right? In the airport, you become their life. Uh, your natural life has been exposed to the sovereign violence. Um, so the US border guards, they can take you aside, uh, they can lock you in a room, they can contravene all of your fundamental rights um, whenever they like, uh, because you don't have any rights in the airport. Right? They don't have to justify anything they do to you, um, because the sovereign, the state, has declared the airport a zone of exception uh, or a zone of emergency. Right? When you're in the airport, you are the exception. So you're included in, all right, you're open to sovereign power uh, because you've been specifically excluded from the BIOS, from the American political community. Uh, but you're not ZOE either. You're in the state of inclusive exclusion. You're between ZOE and BIOS. And this is why the US uh, and many other states now um, can undertake what Agamben calls biopolitical tattooing. Um, because since you've, been, uh, since you've been deemed to be in a zone of exception in the airport, uh, they can force bio biopolitical information from you that you would never have to give in any other situation. Right? If a police officer came up to you in New Zealand or in the US and said, all right, we want your fingerprints, we're going we're to put them on our file. You would just say, no, you have absolutely no right to demand that of me. If they arrest you for something, they can take your fingerprints. But they can't just demand fingerprints randomly from random people. But at the border, all right, the airport, um, they can demand that information from you, and there's nothing you can do about it. They can demand this biopolitical information, um, and they can then use that information as a form of biopower as a form of you know, managing and controlling people and controlling populations. Now we can think of these kinds of spaces as what Agamben calls the camp. Um, so Agamben traces the emergence of the camp um, to concentration camps in uh, the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, and historically these camps are associated with state of emergency, um, state of exception, and, and martial law. Um, so the camps in the US during the Second World War that in turn Japanese American um, citizens like this one here, uh, uh, they're a pretty good example of this, I think. Uh, the camp was deemed an exceptional space. Uh, 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 and this space was external to the legal order, right? And due to the state of emergency due to the war. Uh, so Gambin describes camps as a piece of territory that is placed outside the normal juridical order. But in line with what we've been discussing, uh, the camp is not simply an external space, because the camp uh, excludes what's captured inside the camp. So the Japanese Americans uh, living in the in internment camps, and there were a lot of them, about 100, 150,000 uh, uh, Japanese Americans interned in these camps, um, were excluded from the juridical order by being included in these camps. Uh, so in this way, this, the, the camp blurs this conventional uh, spatial uh, distinction between internal and external. In the camp, you know, law is suspended and exceptional processes become the rule. Uh, and in this way, Gambin describes the camp as the most absolute biopolitical sp bio space that has ever been realized, a space in which power confronts nothing other than pure biological life without any mediation. So those in the camp, or those in the camp they've been made into bare life, um, and the power of the sovereign can operate on them directly without any kind of mediation at all. They're neither inside the law, nor are they outside the law. They're neither BIOS, nor are they ZOE. Now, it's really no coincidence at all that the border, uh, the airport, became a, a zone of exception uh, to the extent that we currently find it, um, and that forms of biopolitical control grew at the border uh, around the same time that Guantanamo Bay um, uh, detention camp and the Nauru um, Processing Center, for example, were both founded. All of these things came about after 9-11. They came, out, came about because of the war on terror. 
Uh, so the war on terror made it such that the state of emergency, the state of exception, became the norm. So for Agamben, this realm of bare life, uh, this realm between Zoe and Bios, became uh, or has become coincidental uh, with the realm of politics. Right? So originally he thinks the realm of bare life was at the margins of the political order, uh, but he thinks that over time, increasingly, all politics becomes uh, part of this, um, pl or a place of inclusive exclusion. Right? All politics, especially after 9-11, has become, gov has become governed by uh, the arbitrary ability of the sovereign uh, to act on any of us at any time as bare life. Um, and this may seem like an extreme conclusion, but I'm, I'm not sure it is. Uh, I think it's harder to envision in New Zealand, um, because while we've been in involved in the war on terror in some ways, um, we're kind of also somewhat on the periphery of it. Uh, but I think generally speaking, if you're declared a terrorist, um, if, you're declared, you know, if you're declared a terrorist, you are declared outside uh, the legal order in some pretty important ways. Um, because terrorists are, after all, the enemy, uh, and the enemy is conceptualized in this way that makes them not really even human. Uh, so the designation terrorist brings with it the kind of inclusive exclusion uh, that puts you in this indistinct zone of their life. Um, I think, you know, in fundamental ways, being declared a terrorist uh, means losing your fundamental rights. You're subject directly and in an unmediated way to the will of the sovereign. Uh, anything can be done to you, right? You're completely open to the sovereign violence. You can be tortured, you can be imprisoned indefinitely, and that's especially the case in the US after the, um, uh, the Patriot Act was passed. Um, you can be placed in, in places like Guantanamo Bay still, uh, without the government ever really having to justify doing so. And the reason for this is that is terrorism is this constant, ongoing state of emergency. It's this permanent state of exception um, that's at the heart of the way that politics now works um, in many so-called developed democratic countries. Now, of course, the sovereign has the power to declare anyone at any time a terrorist. Right? They don't have to justify this. Uh, because once you're a terrorist, you are, you're beyond, you're outside this legal framework. Um, so the state of emergency, the state of exception, is ongoing and encompasses us, uh, all of us, all of the time. Uh, sovereign decision could at any moment put us, any of us, in the realm of bare life. So for Agamben, this idea of the camp, um, and the idea of the state of exception that underlies the idea of the camp uh, is really fundamental to politics, all politics now, he thinks. It's fundamental to the current political order um, and the way that power operates within this political order. So the camp, he thinks, is the spatial, particular spatial manifestation of this logic of power. Um, he thinks this, the camp itself is symptomatic of this logic of power. It's not simply this random thing that occurs for various contingent historical reasons, um, it's really it's something that comes out of the fact that the state of exception has become uh, the rule. So in this way, Gambin describes the camp as the hidden matrix and nomos of the political space in which we live. Right, so camps are these spatially distinct uh, uh, states of exception, um, and they disclose to us the basic fundamental structuring of politics uh, and life more generally um, that underlies modern society. Um, and one, another example of this is uh, exactly what Black Lives Matter are protesting about, right? The point um, that Black Lives Matter uh, tries to make is they're, they're pointing out that the sovereign, um, through the police, uh, can decide that anyone, um, though it tends to be black men in particular, um, are the enemy, are dangerous, are the exception. Right? It can put them in the state of bare life uh, where they can be killed by police on very little pretext at all. And the police are never held to account for this. Uh, so we can observe the logic of sovereignty uh, and sovereign power most clearly in the case of the camp. Uh, but the very same logic applies in all these so-called normal spaces outside the camp. 
Um, it all comes out of this very same nomos, this uh, uh, very same structure of power, this normativity, uh, the structure of law that underlies, again, but thinks all politics uh, in our current moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, think about, um, I mean, because of relationships between states, maybe you're somewhat protected. But if you think of someone, say, smuggling or caught smuggling drugs into Thailand, right? Um, like an embassy can say, oh, don't, don't kill our citizen. Um, but ultimately, they, they have no power to, to force the Thai government to do anything. It's still totally up to the Thai government, right? So they can ask. So if the U.S. decides, you know, to take a New Zealand citizen and do something to them, the New Zealand government can say, you know, please don't do that. Um, but they can't make the U.S. do anything once they've got you, once you're in the zone of exception, right? I was thinking more about the space um, we have in the space. Isn't it coming past the territory of the land of the country? Yeah. I think, um, I think in the embassy you'd go straight from one legal order to another legal order. Although maybe there'd be complications perhaps. I don't know. I don't know about how law works in, in the embassy, but there's definitely law, right? Like if you're in uh, the US and you go into a New Zealand embassy, then you're subject to New Zealand laws once you're in that embassy. So you're still covered by a legal order, you still have rights. Whereas the airport, for example, um, you don't. You lose, you lose your rights. You're not covered by either legal order. So, yep. Or to what extent you are subject to international law? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm honestly not sure. You're certainly. I think in the airport, the the, the state can sort of declare you anything it wants. You know what I mean? Um, whereas, yeah. So there probably are there probably are laws, but once you're actually within the state itself, then you can be accepted from those laws. Because you, you're not outside the state when you're in the US, right? If you're in the airport. Um, if you were outside the state, if you were in international waters or something, maybe then international law would apply. Um, so you're in the state, and therefore the, the sovereign has the ability to exclude you while still keeping you from being covered by international law. Yeah. OK. I want to finish there. Um, next week, our, f our last week before the break, we'll look at uh, Jacques Derrida and Jean Baudrillard, um, both of whom are interesting, kind of tricky.